Shine on, you crazy Grand Seiko dials. Time and tide waited for a hodinky. And I give you my two cents on the state of the industry. It's episode 87 of A Week in Watches, a semi-weekly look back at new releases and interesting stories from the watch industry. I'm Zach Weiss, co-founder of Worn and Wound, and I'll be your host today. Geneva Watch Days is just two weeks out, and though I won't personally be in attendance, I can't wait for it, as that will basically mark the return of the industry from its European vacation. So this week, we only have a couple of watches to talk about, and then I address some questions from the Worn and Wound Plus Slack community. Yeah, well, kind of. But before we get there, did you know that next week, starting August 19th, is National Aviation Week? Well, I didn't either until just a few days ago. But since flying, piloting, and travel are such integral parts of the watch industry, we've decided to celebrate it at the Windup Watch Shop by focusing on the amazing and diverse selection of pilots' watches we stock. From fleegers to contemporary Anna Digi designs, there's likely one that speaks to your inner aviator. Head over to windupwatchshop.com to check out the festivities starting August 19th. Okay, Grand Seiko sparkles with some new US exclusives. Grand Seiko's back doing what Grand Seiko does, which is bring out some very pretty limited editions with a sort of poetic, if slightly confusing meaning, and then limit them to just one region. Thankfully, that region this time is the US, so those of us stateside are in luck. Sorry, rest of the world. Labeled the SBGA 507 and 509, these 44 GS spring drive models were created to celebrate a trio of similar limited editions that were released in 2018 when the Grand Seiko of America Corporation was established. That trio consisted also of 44 GS spring drive models, one in platinum, one in rose gold, and one in steel. Common between them, other than the movement and the case shape, was the use of the Kirazuri dial texture. Kirazuri refers to a type of traditional Japanese woodblock printing that utilizes mica for a sparkle effect. The Grand Seiko concept appears almost as a linen texture with tiny fibers crisscrossing throughout, the ridges of which create a slight sparkle. On a personal note, this is one of my favorite Grand Seiko textures along with the Mount Awate, as the effect is very subtle yet appealing. This is what's featured on my SPGW277, another US exclusive limited edition from a few years ago. And I very much enjoy how it's not like any other dial, yet not so dramatic as to be the center of attention. I found the heavier textures can get tiring after a while. So what does this have to do with the new watches? Well, the SPGA507 and 509 also feature said texture, so along with the case and the movement, they are sort of an extension of this original series. It's worth noting that the SPGA387, which was the steel model in that original trio, is one of the more collectible Grand Seiko LEs, still retaining a decent value. So it's a trio worth revisiting. In terms of the new models, the dials are inspired by the changing skies over Lake Sua, a favorite inspiration for Grand Seiko that is located near the Seiko Epson Shiojiri factory where spring drive watches are made. Because you see, these watches not only celebrate the trio of limited editions from 2018, but also the 20th anniversary of the spring drive 9R64 caliber. Grand Seiko loves to layer meaning. As such, You'll find the 507 features a medium dark blue that is suggestive of early evening over Lake Sua, and the 509 a dusty rose that speaks to early morning over Lake Sua. Am I the only one that wishes the reference numbers on those were reversed so morning came before evening? Does this kind of stuff matter to anyone but me? Whatever, these happen to be two of the more beautiful colors Grand Seiko has deployed in some time. The blue being neither the ice or midnight they tend to go with, but rather a true, almost dark denim blue. And the dusty rose, which has an earth tone quality, is neither the soft pinks nor the dark reds that they have typically embraced. I'd have a hard time picking between these two, not to mention all of the other versions of the 44GS spring drive. Should one of these two suit your fancy, and you are stateside, they are available at Grand Seiko Boutiques, select ADs, as well as their online boutique, and are priced at 5600 which includes a bracelet. They're limited to 300 units per model. Unfortunately, both are currently showing as out of stock online, but that doesn't mean they are sold out at boutiques quite yet. Hodinki revives an old complication. I have to give credit where credit is due. Hodinki's collaborations with Tag Heuer have been by far the best looking watches Tag has released in memory. First, there was the Skipperera, which conceptually revived a mythical vintage Hoyer with fantastic colors, and then the Carrera Dato, which brought back another odd old design that put the date at nine. It's a personal favorite Hoyer reference as well. Both featured just Hoyer on the dial and seemed to wake the mass market luxury titan up to the value of the enthusiast community. 
perhaps proving this in the years since we've seen the launch of the Glassbox Carrera, which still is the most successful merger of old and new watch aesthetics a brand, particularly a luxury group brand, has pulled off. They honestly were one of the highlights from Watches and Wonders 2023. And also, they've added new Skipperera and Dato models, though sans collab. Well, just last week, Hodinkee announced their newest collaboration with TAG, and it's probably the most ambitious yet. Called the TAG Heuer Carrera Chronograph Seafarer X Hodinkee, it's a spiritual revival of a highly collectible Heuer from the 1960s, the Abercrombie & Fitch Seafarer. Yes, this watch was made for and branded as Abercrombie & Fitch, which at the time was a sporting goods store along the lines of Orvis or L.L. Bean, and not the brand you associate with the worst people in your high school class. Based on the Ottavia 2446, the original 1968 Seafarer featured the same sporty compressor case design with rotating bezel and 100 meters of water resistance, and was powered by a Valju 72 manual wound chronograph movement, but with one significant modification. The active second subdial at 9 was replaced with a tide indicator with a pusher set function. Tide indicators are basically moon phase discs with special markings. Around the edge is an index indicating hours on a 12 a.m. to 12 p.m. scale and back, and the disc at the center features a circle with eight sectors and a crosshair. The idea being that as the disc rotates, the sectors illustrate when high and low tide are during the day. Blue zones for high, white for low, crosshairs for peak, which slowly changes following the phase of the moon. The button is used to aid in setting the dial to local charts. It can also double as a moon phase by setting the crescent shape to be pointed up at noon on the day of a full moon. New moon when it's at the bottom and last quarter on the left. All in all, a neat widget and frankly, a more practical use of a moon phase. Though sadly, the 1968 Seafarer was the last Hoyer to utilize it. Well, until now that is, as obviously it's the highlight feature of the new watch. So the Carrera Chronograph Seafarer X Hodinkee revives the Seafarer concept in function and color, but utilizes the new Carrera glass box format. If you're thinking, but wasn't the 1968 Seafarer in an Ottavia case? You'd be right, and yet there is precedent as Seafarers between 1963 and 1968 featured the iconic 2447 Carrera case that the glass box references. It's a bit confusing as they could have used a colorway that referenced the Carrera version rather than the later Ottavia one, but unless that level of minutia really matters to you, it doesn't make the watch any better or worse. And who knows, maybe those colorways are to come later. Anyway, the modern Seafarer features the new TH20-13 caliber, which is based on the Hoyer 02 that is found in other Glassbox Carreras. However, it's the 12 hour counter that has been replaced as it is at nine on that movement. They went with the 42 millimeter case instead of the 39 millimeter, which is perhaps a reference to larger Ottavia or just a practical decision or who knows, but I doubt it has helped the sales. And finally, the bezel is an internal 60 second minute scale. Other than Carrera, the dial also features the full Tag Heuer logo instead of the more enthusiast-friendly classic Heuer logo, and Seafarer is located at the top of the seconds counter. With the silver and blue sub-dials on a black surface, the tide indicator, and extra pusher at 9, the watch comes together to be quite attractive and just the right amount of unusual, if 42mm is a bit of a stretch. The Carrera Chronograph Seafarer X Hodinkee is priced at $7,950 and is limited to 968 units. It's available through Hodinkee's online shop as well as tag retailers. Okay, is the watch industry all right? News is slow right now, so this week I turned to our free to join Warning One Plus Slack community for some questions. And well, there were some surprisingly tough ones with many revolving around the idea of the watch industry in crisis which is to say news that things are in decline or slowing down, that business isn't good and it might affect us, the watch enthusiasts. So I figured I'd give my two cents on the matter. I'm gonna start by saying that this is not really something I dwell on. I don't read earning reports, I don't invest in luxury groups, nor do I buy watches on spec. I'm really just into watches. I love watches. I'm here for the watches. But I've also been doing this daily for over 13 years and co-own a business in the industry, so I'm not blind to it either. The most obvious thing about this news is that you see it because it's catchy. It's clickbait. Everyone just wants you to read or watch their version of the story. But as the consumer, you see a disproportionate amount being served to you, so it can be overly alarming. But that's also not to say it's not true either. Yes, things have come down from what was a crazy couple of years that followed a, hopefully, once-in-a-lifetime pandemic. 
spending changed, cryptocurrency boomed, disposable income went to luxury goods, prices went up, it drew in more people, more attention, suddenly watches were about money, value, and return on investment. It was a feeding frenzy, and if you didn't think it was eventually going to end, you've never heard of a bubble. Now we're out, and things are changing or correcting. This is all obvious, well-trodden territory. Are pre-owned prices less horrifying? Yeah. Has that hurt some businesses? Sure. Are earnings down for some big groups? Yes, especially ones that overcompensated for insane demand. But how are things compared to before this all happened? I dare say the watch industry improved as a whole because of the bubble, because of the demand and the attention in ways that will never go away. So it's been a net positive if what you care about is the watches. And this is what I think watch enthusiasts should focus on. And I say enthusiasts intentionally. If you're just here to make 10% on a new watch a few months later, you're not here for the watches. Okay, I don't love losing money on anything either, but if you got to enjoy a watch for a few years before you let it go for a small loss, consider it a rental fee. But back to the point. Before the bubble, watches were different. Now they feel better made, especially those by micro brands. And they seem better designed all around, especially by big brands. To clarify, I would say the micro brands and indies always focused more on interesting designs that appealed to enthusiasts, where big brands were focused on broader sales and thus more generic designs. Now the big brands care more about the enthusiast's opinion, or at least seem to just a little bit. I'd point to the Black Bay 54 and the current generation of Speedmaster as evidence of that. While enthusiasts are a small part of the overall watch market, we are by far the most influential. Trends start with us and our numbers grew by a lot over the last few years. So when we latch onto something, it trickles out to the larger market. A good example of this are the watches I see now around New York City. It used to be a rare and exciting moment to see a Seiko on someone's wrist. Now I see all sorts of things. Just the other week, I saw a Ming, a Ver, a vintage Rolex, and a Smith's W10 within a few days all on the subway. And a couple of days ago, I was out at a nice restaurant and spotted a brew just two tables down. I think that's pretty amazing. The other thing to keep in mind is that this news of crisis is only being written about because it affects the largest brands. But is it really a sign of what's happening to everyone? I'm not so sure. Christopher Ward, for example, claimed an 80% growth in sales last year and are on track to do the same this year. And Baltic is opening showrooms around the world. And these aren't the only brands we talk to that are continuing to do well, if not better than before. To wrap up my rambling train of thought here, this is how I see it. Things went crazy for a while, but are coming down, which is affecting a certain segment of the industry and definitely has not been great for some folks out there. But in terms of the state of things, there are more watch enthusiasts than ever before, as well as far greater awareness of the watch industry. For brands that are able to continue to make product that people actually want, there's still a market for it. I actually think things are primed for the smaller brands to continue to grow and impress as uniqueness and novel, perhaps even daring ideas are more important than before. So that's what I'm hoping we'll see. Let me know what you think in the comments. And that's it for episode 87 of A Week in Watches. Stay cool, like, and subscribe. See you in the future. It's a spiritual revival of a highly collectible Hoyer from the 1960s, the Abercrombie, the Abercrombie and Fitch Sear, oh my God. Is there like, none of these are real words.